I'm sorry. Okay. We'll be. How can I preach us into heaven if I can't even figure out whether it's morning or evening? Huh? <laughs> We're going to be studying Cain and Abel this afternoon. And it's from Genesis, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 17. Uh, it's a very important study. We learn many things about what God expects of man. We learn about man's need to obey God. We learn that there are consequences for sin, for disobeying God. And we learn the, the, that the fact is, is that faith has its reward uh, in pleasing God uh, from that time forward. God always expected faith. God always expected man to obey. In Genesis, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 2, Adam knew his wife and conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Notice the words, Adam knew his wife, Eve. The word know in the Hebrew language, and is even used in the New Testament, in the Greek language, uh, carries with it the idea of just simply to know something. It does in the Hebrew, it does in the Greek. In Genesis 3, verse 7, we read, The eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. They knew something. They understood something at this point in time. In Genesis 8, verse 11, So no one knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. He knew something. He recognized something to be true. He knew this to be a fact. But the word can also mean to know someone in a sexual sense. In Genesis, the fourth chapter, verse 25, we read, Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son. In this case, what does it mean? Same thing it means here. It, he knew her, and it produced a child. That knowledge here has to do not with, hey, I just met you, Eve, or hey, I'm just getting to know you, Eve, but rather it has to do with the fact that they had sexual relations, and therefore they brought forth a child in this case. In Genesis 19, verse 5, we read, they called him unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. This was an invitation to sodomy. They wanted to know these men, not have a cup of coffee with them, not to get to know them over, uh, over a game of dominoes or a game of checkers. This was something more. This had to do with knowing them in a sexual sense. This is referring to the sodomy, uh, sodomy. that was the case in... in uh, uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah. In Genesis 19, verse 8, Lot reply, the, the host replies, Behold, Lot replies, I have two daughters which have not known men. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do unto them as is good in your eyes. What was he saying? I've got two daughters that have not known men. Does that mean that they never met a man? Never got acquainted with a man? Never visited with a man? No, that's not what it means. It means that they have not known man in a sexual sense. And so this is the way it's used here in Genesis 4, verses 1 and 2. Adam knew his wife Eve. And what is the result of that? Well, she bare Cain. The name means possession or possessed, his, uh, according to Hitchcock's Dictionary of Bible Names. Cain, now, he was a tiller of the ground, farming is and has been and always will be a noble profession. There's nothing wrong with being a farmer. Jesus referred to farming and used that in his illustrations. In the parable of the sower, Matthew 13, verse 1 through 9, and 18 through 23, where he explains that parable. The wicked husbandman, in Matthew 21, verses 33 through 36 is also an example where he refers to uh, agriculture. The enemy sowing the weeds among the wheat. In Matthew 13, verses 24 through 30, the Bible certainly portrays form, farming in a good and proper way. Nothing at all wrong with a man being a farmer. And so Cain was a farmer, and there was nothing wrong with him being a farmer. But it doesn't stop here. And she bare again, and she had his brother Abel. Now the name here means vanity, 
breath, vapor. It can mean morning. He is a keeper of sheep. And there's nothing wrong with being a keeper of sheep. David himself, who became king, was a shepherd, a keeper of sheep. 1 Samuel 17, verses 34 through 35. Jesus is called the good shepherd in John 10, verses 11 through 14. What a wonderful beginning this is. This is the beginning of the filling of the earth. You have two sons, one who raises crops that can feed not only livestock, but to feed man as well. Grains are good for man. They're proper for man. It's, 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 it's a good thing. But also, there was Cain, who's a sheep, keeper of sheep, who provided meat. It provides skin for clothing. And what else would it provide? Wool to keep one warm, you say. Also, clothing or bedding, whatever the case may be. And so we have two boys here who have two different occupations, and yet both occupations, good and honorable, and a wonderful beginning to the human race, as it were. However, there's more to it. It doesn't stop there. And that's found in verses 3 through 5. Worship enters in by the command of God. In Genesis 4, beginning in verse 3, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground, an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Now Cain and Abel here provide the very first glimpse of worship to God. You want to begin a study in worship? Here's a good place to do it. Whether it be in, your pri in private or whether it be for teaching a Bible class or whether it be for bringing a lesson. This is an excellent start to study worship. It's to study Cain and Abel here. Cain and Abel bring their offerings to the Lord. It is a fact that from the very beginning God expected man to worship him. He's worthy of worship. In Revelation 4, verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they were created. We were created to serve. We're created to worship. If you were to design or make a machine that was to do a thing, whether it be to, to mop the floor, to sweep the floor, or to, to build something, and that machine would not work, and there's no getting it to work, what would you do? You'd probably throw that machine in the trash, do away with it. Well, God made us, and he made us for a purpose, and that was to bring glory to him and honor him, to worship him and to praise him. And he's worthy of it because he is our creator. Now, because he is our creator, he has the right to expect certain things of us. And one of those things is worship. David, in a psalm, after bringing the ark to Jerusalem, in 1 Chronicles 16, verses 27 through 29, said, Glory and honor are in his presence. Strength and gladness are in his place. Given to the Lord, ye kindreds of the people. Given to the Lord glory and strength. Given to the Lord the glory due to his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. It is clear. It is just as clear as it can be that this is the case. That man should worship and praise God. It's also the case that faith is involved in our worship. We read in Hebrews 11 verse 4 that by faith Abel offered a more perfect sacrifice under Cain, than Cain by the which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Quite often Dub is referred to the last part of this especially recently as he talked about the scripture cache. 
I want us to notice, though, that the offering that was accepted, the offering that was by Abel, was an offering that was by faith. Faith is necessary. It always has been necessary. Hebrews 11, verse 6. For it is impossible to please God without faith. I believe that is an eternal truth that no man during any period of time from the Old Testament forward could please God without faith in God. Romans 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You want to know how to grow your faith? You want to know how to develop faith? You want to know how to walk by faith? You turn to God's word and let it lead you because when we follow God's word, we're walking by faith. Now, it would first seem natural for Cain to offer the fruit of the ground and Abel to offer from his flock simply because of the fact that they each had this in their career. Cain was for of grain. So it would be natural, it would seem, that he would offer something that he had raised, something that he had produced himself. That would seem like the most natural thing in the world. Kind of like we hear people today, well, if you've got a talent, use it for the Lord, you know. That sounds good, doesn't it? But it doesn't work in God's eyes. Cain's offering was rejected. God did not have respect to, to Cain's offering. Abel's was accepted because the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. Why? Because Abel offered by faith, and Cain did not. One did what the Lord said. The other one had the attitude, well, this is what I grew. This is what I should offer. This is my talent. This is my ability. So I ought to, I ought to give them my ability. I ought to give them my talents. Then you may be the best fisherman in the country. Go out and catch the biggest bass that can be caught in every tournament. But let me tell you something. You can go out and fish all day and catch all the fish you want. That doesn't that's not worship to God. It's just not. You may have that talent, that ability, but that doesn't make it pleasing to God to try to worship Him that way. Well, 1 Samuel 15, <laughs> verses 22 through 23, we answer the question, will God be pleased with just any and every sacrifice that we might offer. Many people seem to think so. But Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath rejected thee from being king. And there's preachers all over the place who say, I don't care what the Lord said. We're going to have a praise team. We're going to have a gymnasium. We're going to have this or we're going to do that. They think that they can set themselves up above the Lord or give of their talents, as it were. And it will be pleasing to the Lord, whether it's what the Lord said to do or not. Verses 20 and 21. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out devils in thy name? Have we not taught in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful works in thy name? And then will I profess unto them, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never knew you. Why? Because they did not do the will of their Father. Yes, they prophesied or taught in the name of Jesus. Yes, they cast out devils in the name of Jesus. Yes, they, they did many wonderful works in the name of Jesus. But guess what? They didn't do what God said to do. That's what Cain did. He didn't do what God said to do. How do I know that? Because Abel offered by faith. Cain didn't. How does faith come? By the word of the Lord. Romans 10 verse 17. 
So one offered what God said to do, believed God and offered what he said to do. The other one didn't. Today there's people who read the Bible. They read what God says to do, and they read about heaven, they read about hell, and for some reason they think that they can be like Cain and just do whatever they want to do in worship and in service to God. And it simply does not work that away. John 4, verse 24, Jesus Christ said it, and he, I believe, well, it doesn't matter whether I believe it or not. The fact is, Jesus said it, so that's the truth. Now listen to what he said. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him. Whoa, what? Must worship him. It's not a suggestion. It's not a, I think you ought to. This is a situation where he's using the term must. They that worship him must worship him. How? In spirit and in truth. In spirit, in all sincerity, from the innermost your innermost being, as it were. Sincerity and in truth. What is truth? John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is what? Truth. And so, we must worship God in all sincerity and in truth. Now, isn't that the very same thing that was expected of Cain and Abel? Is there any difference God gave them the truth how he wanted them to worship him. God gave them the truth, and yet one of them rejected that truth, and the other one accepted it. And the one who rejected it, his offering was rejected by God. Luke 6, verse 46, and this is just as important today, and it needs to be repeated, and people need to think about it. Jesus said, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Preachers standing up in pulpits today say, Oh, you don't have to be baptized for the remission of sins. Preachers standing up in pulpits today say, Water doesn't matter. Other people saying that, that, that uh, you can be baptized or not be baptized. It, you, it doesn't matter whether you're baptized or not. Other preachers getting up and saying, No matter whether you use a piano in worship or drums in worship or this or that. And they bring all kinds of foolishness in. And Jesus cries out, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Why don't we simply do what the Bible says and not go beyond or fall short of the things that he has given us, especially as it regards worship in this context? Well, in spite of all this, Cain chose not to obey. Cain, like many today, became angry when he was confronted with his error. The scripture says that he was wroth. He was wroth, boiling anger. Anger that just simply would not go away. The prim it's a, according to Strong's, it's a primitive root to glow or to grow warm usually to blaze up of anger, zeal, and jealousy. Be angry to burn. You ever have something just hit you, and it just goes all over you, boom, like that? Wrath. Wrath. Sometimes it comes a little bit different way. Sometimes something may even strike you funny at first, or light, and you don't think too much about it. The more you think about it, the hotter you get about it. Wrath in both cases. If it becomes that boiling over type of anger, like a pot boiling over. While there is such a thing as righteous anger, the kind of anger that Cain fueled leads to sin. In James 1, verse 20 we read, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Proverbs 14, verse 17, He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. Some of the most Stupid things I've said and positions I've taken has been when I was angry at somebody. Some of the quickest assumptions I made that were wrong about somebody or something was when I was angry at them. Causes me to jump to conclusions that weren't true, doesn't it? Anger can cause all kinds of problems, and we need to be careful about that. Well, he that is soon angry deals foolishly, 
and a man of wicked devices is hated. In Genesis 4, verses 6 through 8, continuing, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, thou shalt not be accepted. If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Cain's give, God's giving Cain an opportunity to change his attitude. <coughs> He's giving Cain an opportunity to repent and do right, you see. What is he telling him? Well, he's telling him that sin's waiting at the door. It's like a lion waiting at the door, ready to pounce on you. But you can rule over him. You can control him if you choose to. He doesn't have to destroy you. He doesn't have to kill you. And so the choice is yours. Will you let, this, will you let sin slay you, rule over you, be your master? Or will you conquer sin? Well, you and I today need to be aware of the danger of sin. It stalks each and every one of us. Listen to 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So again, in the New Testament, Satan's compared to a stalking lion, someone who would devour us, someone who would chew us up, as it were, and spit us out. The fact is, God is no respecter of persons. Someone says, well, God ordained Abel to be saved and Cain to be lost. Neither one had a choice in the matter. You know, that's the position of some folks who believe in Calvinism, that none of us have a choice. It's all pre-programmed, and we don't have the freedom to choose what we will do. Well, that's not true. They did have that freedom. They did have that choice. In Acts 10, verses 34 through 35, Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But listen to this. In every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. I don't care if you're talking about America. I don't care if you're talking about Russia, China. I don't care if you're talking about North Korea. You can be talking about our friends or our enemies as far as countries are concerned. When it comes to the people in those countries, if they obey the gospel and they follow the gospel, they're accepted of God. They do what God says to do. Yes, indeed. God is no respecter of persons. Cain did have a choice in the matter. He wasn't forced to this. He wasn't pre-programmed for it. Just as you and I have a choice in the matter today. We choose whether we will worship God properly. We choose whether we will serve him properly. In Genesis 4, verses 8 through 12, Cain talked with Abel, his brother. It came to pass that when they were in the field that Cain rose up against his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And thou art now cursed from the earth, and which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall henceforth yield unto her her strength, a fugitive and a vagabond thou be in the earth. Notice, Cain's anger led him to do what? Murder. We, you remember? We read that he was wroth. Friends, listen to the news. Road rage. You ever hear road rage? Pretty common today, isn't it? People get mad. They shoot people in other cars. Sometimes, not too long ago, somebody shot into the back of a car, killed a little baby in the back seat. Road rage caused that. Man didn't control his temper. Got upset. People get mad. I used to get so irritated. I listened to the radio, the amateur radio at the, the what well, would be a bunch of a bunch of amateurs coming home, and where they get off work, they visit on the way home. Nothing wrong with that, okay? Perfectly all right. Amateur radio's a good hobby. But what would irritate me was they'd get to talking about all the idiot drivers around them, <laughs> as though they'd never pulled an idiotic stunt themselves. <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
We forget that. And two, I've seen people complain about somebody doing something wrong whenever it wasn't that clear if you were not a citizen of that community. You get into another town or another city, and sometimes the road signs aren't that clear. What you're supposed to do isn't that clear. And people make mistakes, and they do things that's wrong can cause wreck. doesn't mean they're an idiot. Sometimes it's not just clear signs and clear directions. Well, friend, let me tell you something. We need to be careful about our anger. It can get us into trouble. It got Cain into trouble because Cain went out and he slew his brother Abel. In 1 John 3, verse 12, we read, Not as Cain, who wasn't that wicked one. Who's the wicked one? Satan. And slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Sometimes people are teased, sometimes they're taunted, sometimes they're hated because they're doing what's right and what's proper. I've heard of places where young girls are teased if they're still virgins. That shouldn't be the case. Why are they being teased? Because they've done, others have done wrong and they want others to join them in doing wrong. They can't take it because somebody isn't going along with them, you see. It's always amazed me how whenever, just to show you the way the world is, you remember Tebow? Now, I'm not a his religion or anything like that, but what would he do whenever he'd make a go? You remember how he'd bow down on the knee and give thanks to the Lord? He received a lot of criticism for that. And I'm not necessarily advocating that we who are Christians need to give thanks for the Lord if we make a touchdown in football or anything like that. But he received a lot of criticism. And yet whenever the man came out and was changed over to a woman who was a celebrity, what did everybody do in the media? Made him out to be a hero. Shows the double standard and the mockery that Christians endure. If they'd have applied that to, to Tebow, who was making those touchdowns and praying to the Lord, they'd have been praising him for standing up for what he believed and what was right. Well, this is the way the world looks at it. In 1 John 3, verse 15, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Where did it start? It starts with anger. Moves to murder. Moves to hatred and then to murder. In Matthew 15, verse 19, For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulterers, fornications, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. It's where Dove's lesson about and points about people saying, This isn't me comes in. Where do these things come from? They come from our own heart, don't they? They come from within us. Where did Cain's murder for his brother come in? It came from within him. His anger his, turned into hatred for his brother. And he left that anger dominating till sin ruled him and destroyed him. In Matthew 15, verse 19, it's very clear these things come out of our, came from us, not from outside. And yet what do we do every time? We want to blame someone else. What did, he, what did Cain do after that? Well, he tried lying to cover up his sin. Am I my brother's keeper? I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Verse 9. He tries to put God on the defensive by asking that question. God, am I my brother's keeper? Answer me that, will you? How dare him try to put God on the defensive? There's a place for asking a question to answer a charge or to, to, to answer in debate. There's a place for that, but not against our God. There's no place for that kind of response. Cain forgot that God is all-knowing. The voice of thy brother's blood cried to me from the ground. He not only was his brother's keeper, he was his brother's murderer. You see, it was wrong. I'd like to read from Psalms 139, beginning in verse 7. This is what Cain did not fully realize. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, that's Sheol in the Old Testament, meaning the grave, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings 
of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea. Even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be a light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou coverest me in my mother's womb. Friend, there's nothing you and I can do, there's nothing you and I can think that the Lord doesn't know. He's aware of it. He is all-knowing, and he knows our thoughts, he knows our hearts, and he knows our actions. Cain forgot that. He thought he could hide things from God. I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? What a response. Verses 11 through 12. There's always punishment for sin. Cain would plead that his punishment was greater than he could bear. But his punishment is really nothing compared to the punishment of eternal hell. Jesus taught about this many, many times. Jesus taught in, in uh, the parable of the virgins. And at the end of that, he, he gives this uh, judgment where the sheep are divided from the goats. And the sheep will go into everlasting life, but the goats into eternal torment. And so we understand that there's a punishment that's coming. There's a time that's coming. You can plead and you can cry, but the punishment is great and the punishment is terrible. How many people overlook these facts about the punishment? In Revelation 20, verse 10, it says the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Have you ever had burning sulfur drip on your finger? It don't go out very quick. Have you ever had plastic that was burning fall on your finger or upon a part of your body? It keeps on burning, doesn't it? It doesn't go out very quick. And because of that, it's terribly painful. Friend, that is nothing compared to hell. I've worked with the ambulance service and gone out and picked up people that have been in accidents. I've picked up people that have been burned. And as much pain as they were in, as terrible as that pain is, it's nothing, absolutely nothing, compared to the pain and the torment of hell. In Luke 16, verses 23 through 24, the rich man lifts up his eyes. He's in torments. He sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom, and he cries, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus. <laughs> he may dip the tip of his finger in water and come for I'm tormented in this flame. Now we realize that there's figurative language that's involved here. It still teaches of grave truth and a fact about this, and that is that the punishment of torment, the punishment of hell is great and that we won't even get one drop of relief. Have you ever been in pain, terrible pain? One thing that gives you hope is knowing that that pain's going to end. If that pain wouldn't end, you'd have a nightmare about it. It'd just be awful. But we hope it will end, whether it be a broken arm, whether it be burn or whatever it might be. We expect the pain to end sometime. If we've got cancer or something like that, we go to the doctor and say, give me something for my pain. Because we don't like it. It hurts. It's painful. It's tormenting. Sometimes people, as they grow older, they have pains that keep them awake at night. Lay down, they, they get to hurting more than they do during the day. It's painful, 
And they can't sleep sometimes well because of it. It's a torment for them. Friend, it's nothing, absolutely nothing, compared to the torment of hell. Well, in Genesis 4, verses 13 through 16, And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth the same, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Cain's descendants would grow more and more wicked. They'll marry, eventually start marrying the descendants of Seth, who's Cain's brother. And their children will become wicked. And eventually God will destroy the earth by bringing a great flood, saving Noah and his family. We have some great lessons here. Number one that I want to concentrate on. For just a moment, I will go through these. God is worthy of worship. Some people don't think so, but the fact is he is. He is my creator. He made me. He's worthy of worship. He made you. He's worthy of worship. God has the authority to determine how man will worship him. I can't just pick and choose. This isn't Burger King. You remember the old Burger King commercial? You have it your way. That's how people want their religion. They want, it my, they want it their way. They won't be able to do what they want to do. Apparently, that's somewhat the mindset that Cain had. God has the authority. Number three, those who believe God will worship him according to God's will and not man's. I like a piano. I like guitars. Matter of fact, I like music across a number of different genres. I like everything from ragtime to Bach, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky. I like everything from that <coughs> up to some of the songs that Reba McIntyre have sung and others have sung to the Beatles and some of the Rolling Stones, not a lot, but some of the Rolling Stones and others as well. I thoroughly enjoy Ray Stevens, by the way. <laughs> but the thing is, is that doesn't matter. When it comes to worshiping God, I need to worship Him the way He says to. I can save the piano, I can save the guitar, I can save the drums, I can save those other kind of songs for someplace else, for my home, for down at the park, for a show someplace, for the TV. But whenever it comes to worshiping God, I have to do it His way and not my way. Also, number four, God only accepts worship that is in spirit and in truth. It takes both qualities. If I fail in either one, then I'm not worshiping God, correct? I can have all the zeal and the enthusiasm in the world. If I'm not worshiping him the way he said to worship him, then I'm wrong. I can worship him the way he said to worship him and do it lifelessly, without meaning, without having any zeal, any desire, or any, any sincerity about me. And I still fail. I can't have it one or the other. I have to have it both ways. We need to worship God both in spirit and in truth. We can't leave off one. We can't leave off the other. I walk into, what did I say it was? What a burger where you get it your way, Hardee's or whatever. I knew a while ago, I've forgotten now. <laughs> you walk in there, say, I don't want pickles. Well, that's fine, there. But you can't do it in the Lord's, in the Lord's work. You can't do it in worship to the Lord. You can't say, I don't want this, so leave it off. We must worship him in spirit and in truth. The word must is there. Number five, to fail to obey God results in punishment greater than we can imagine. What did Cain say? My punishment is greater than I can bear. There's a punishment waiting for those who do not follow the Lord that's greater than what we can bear. 
The way of life is through following God's will. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. We can say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out devils in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful works in thy name? And then what? Yet God will say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never do. We have to do the will of the Father, period. And so, the way of life is through following God's will, and we must ask the question, what about you? We like Cain, or we like Abel. Do we obey God? Or do we offer what we want to offer, when we want to offer, perhaps, if we want to offer, perhaps? Who are we like? God's word is clear. We must hear the gospel, Romans 10, 13 and 14. We must repent of our sin, believe the gospel, Mark 16, 15 and 16. We must repent of our sins, Acts 3, verses 18 through 20. We must confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8, verses 36 through 38. And then we must be baptized, 1 Peter 3, verse 21. It says, For unto baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. What a wonderful passage to teach that. Some people say it doesn't save. The Bible says it does. I think I'll take the Bible's word. Whose word will you take? And then after that, live faithful ever after, not being conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. It's found in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. What is your choice? Which way do you go? Who will you serve? Will you be like Cain, or will you be like Abel? The choice is yours. If you're subject to the invitation of Jesus Christ, then won't you come while together we stand and while we sing?